So, Sarah, I think everybody can open up their system if they want, you know, yeah. and, 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 and can interact. So go okay. ahead, Sarah. Um, I'll do the quick little intro then. So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our UU virtual roundtable. My name is Sarah Reyes and I will be today's moderator. Um, just one thing before we officially start uh, today's session. And I just want to take the chance to remind everyone that we will be recording this session and uploading it to the UUCLC um, YouTube page. So, um, this is a good resource to have if you ever want to go back and rewatch these videos. Um, or share them with anyone else that you know. Um, and we upload them every Sunday or Monday. Basically, it'll be up by Tuesday. <laughs> um, so it's a good resource to go to have, and I encourage you to go follow it um, since we upload everything every week. And that's about it. So I am done. So everybody can today. open up their, uh, you know, their mute and video. Yeah. So normally we have it where we ask you to remain muted. Um, this time, not so much. Go ahead and you know hop in as during the session as we continue, and feel free to make any comments, questions, concerns as we continue or as we go on rather. Um, besides that, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, session. All right, thank you, Sarah. Okay, so go ahead, stay, uh, Jeffrey. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll go ahead then and uh, share my screen. And I'll click over here to um, and I just uh, I got called out as I was here we go. Um, great. So um, I actually went ahead and left. I adapted this from a, a previous presentation that I've done and um, and so I left the title there, even though it is a little bit different from what we are going to spend most of our time talking about, but it's, it's, it's part of the story. And the title was, Can Technology Save Rangelands and Close the Yield Gap for a Long Time? And by yield gap, what we mean is the gap between the yields that we know we can get or could get on, on our lands throughout the world and the yields that we currently are getting. So, you know, yield gaps are caused by a lot of things. They can be caused by a, a lack of nutrients, poor management, um, degraded soil, um, uh, the, the wrong sort of um, seeds for that location, et cetera. And, um, and again, as, as was noted earlier, I am a, a research scientist with the USDA Ag Research Service uh, based at the Hornotics from the range um, here in Las Cruces. And, um, leading the land PKS project that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, and uh, worked closely with USAID uh, recently. And just thought I'd start, I thought this was an interesting quote. Of course, this was uh, a good 20 years, more than 20 years before the Dust Bowl. Um, and uh, this is a newspaper article out of South Dakota and basically referred to um, this photo is being the crime of the century. Does anybody have any idea why this was viewed as the crime of the century? Because it broke up the prairie. <laughs> broke up the prairie, right. There's your rangeland. That, that would have been bison country. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they, they, they broke up the prairie. And, and sure enough, I mean, that was, you know, like I said, 20 years before the Dust Bowl. But, um, but land degradation, we always think of the Dust Bowl as being an event. But the reality is, they were breaking up prairie that it was not sustainable to crop on long before the dust bowl. We just didn't, the dust didn't make it to Washington until then. And of course, if <laughs> things don't make it to Washington, you know, it, they don't matter. Um, so, uh, you know, here's the, here's the consequences of that. Uh, 20 years later, we've all seen these photos before. So that, that's really what's driven me in, in my, uh, throughout my career is, is how do we better and more effectively match land use with its sustainable potential, whether that's the number of cattle we're grazing or whether we're gra grazing cattle at all in rangelands or whether or not we're going to grow crops. And, um, and that's, that's really motivated me um, in making sure that as a scientist, you know, of course, those decisions on land use are, are made for a variety of reasons. And sometimes people have no place else to grow a crop or graze their cattle and their children are hungry 
and 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 they really you know it's it's not a matter of of the science being there and saying you shouldn't you shouldn't produce here it's it's, it's simply a matter of survival which then of course goes back to issues of human population and maybe if we didn't have quite so many humans we wouldn't have this problem but nevertheless the the, the land use decision itself are made for a lot of reasons but in some cases they're made out of ignorance and if we can reduce that ignorance um through uh through science um you know maybe we can maybe we can keep our our, our world running a little bit longer so this is just one example um does anybody recognize any idea what this crop is or where this picture is from oh wow uh, wow that the, the upper left is not from the moon that's not apollo 11. <laughs> apollo 13. yeah wow that's any idea great. Pretty, uh, pretty barren area. <laughs> pretty barren area. Um, pretty hard to grow crops there. Uh, anybody had quinoa recently? Yeah. What? Quinoa. Quinoa, the grain, Q-I-N-O-A. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't. I haven't. All right. That is, that, that's quinoa being produced on the Altiplano for the high plains of Bolivia. So that's oh, about 12,000 feet elevation. And of course, the, the mountains are going up much higher than that. Those are the Andes. Yeah. 12,000 feet elevation. And, um, and a very well-meaning uh, organization, NGO, um, decided that the people in Bolivia were very poor. And they were right because they were, they were growing the quinoa in a very traditional way up on these, these hillsides here in the background. And, um, and they were planting each seed individually and they weren't cultivating the soil. And down here, there were native um, animals like similar to alpacas. And in fact, there are alpacas in this area that would graze. And, and the, the people would literally hand carry the manure that they collect from the alpacas up and fertilize their, their plants. You can imagine this was not a very um, uh, economically profitable living. In fact, they were barely making it. And so they realized, hey, if we give these folks tractors, they can cultivate this land down here, which was rangeland. And, and so that's why this, this, this is actually a story about rangelands. And this is an, a, a story that the same thing happened in the United States, but it's still happening even now in many places of the world. Um, and, um, and of course, the reality is that there's just not really enough rain on these coarse, sandy soils that don't hold much water down here on the, on the plains to support quinoa production. And, um, and the, the soils are very infertile. And, and after you've removed the rangeland vegetation, they're not very resistant to wind erosion. You can see this powdery soil here, really tough. And so these decisions that we make, sometimes very well-meaning decisions, have huge implications for sustainability, sustainability um, worldwide. Um, and of course, how many people here own a Prius? or a Tesla, or, or a Leaf. My mother does, so we'll just pick on her. So, the, <laughs> the, so this is, uh, if you continue down this, this plain into the lowest part of it, there is a, a playa, a playa lake, it's beautiful. And, um, and of course, these high altitude, low, low precipitation playa areas are where things like not only sodium accumulates, but also lithium. And of course, lithium is what we're using in our batteries, um, including the computer that I'm, I'm, I'm sitting, um, showing this presentation uh, from. And, um, and so again, you know, all of these decisions um, have implications. Um, and, and obviously lithium is something that we really need now so that we can reduce the, uh, the amount of uh, carbon we're emitting into the, the atmosphere. We need those batteries so we can store the power and, and use it in our electric cars and, and, and so forth. But, um, but this is just an example of, of, of one landscape where, um, where these decisions about, you know, what happens to rangelands have big implications. Um, just to provide another example, here's a, here's a piece of land, um, and uh, we'll go down to, to Alabama. And um, in Alabama, they have very old soils. And when you, the soils, as they age over time, what happens is the clay in the surface moves down deeper into the subsurface. And so what you're left with is a, a sandy surface that water can soak into and then clay down deeper. And that's, that's like a, 
sponge and it holds the, the water, which is great. So if you happen to have a, a short drought, which Alabama does, and it's pretty wet down there, but you, you, we've heard in recent years about droughts, you know, it can be all right because they've, you know, the, the water's soaked in and it's, it's stored in that sponge. And the, the, the roots, of course, are very deep, uh, even on something like cotton and peanuts and pecans uh, and so forth. They grow down there. And um, so that's, that's pretty good. But um, as this country song uh, says, um, you know, that red rust clay, well, that, uh, that, that ground that his dad damned his luck on wasn't clay when his grandpa settled it, or his great grandpa. It was actually that sandy soil on top or loamy soil on top and the, and the clay down at the bottom. What happened was all that became eroded as we cultivated it. So there's an example of a place that was previously forested, was converted to cropland. And even though it can be managed sustainably as cropland, unlike that land in Bolivia and unlike a lot of, you know, they, they, they did actually try to do some, some cropping um, in the Hornada Basin. You know, it's just not enough water there. It was sustainable, except they weren't managing it in a way to protect the soil. And so the soil eroded away. And now what happens every time it rains, they get flooding. And people say the flooding is all due to climate change. Well, yeah, I mean, we're getting some more intense storms. But can you imagine if you were getting one and a half inches of water soaking into the soil, and now you're getting less than one millimeter of water soaking into the soil? A lot of that flooding is actually due to mismanagement and soil erosion that occurred decades ago. So again, these decisions that we make about land use and about our natural lands, rangelands as a resource that could be converted to something else, but we want to be careful. Um, this is uh, an example of a, a, an area where we also, it's, sometimes we can't allocate land to its most sustainable use because of tenure issues. This happens to be in, in, um, in Mexico. And here, uh, a wealthy landowner owns the flatlands or relatively flat lands here. And those lands are used to graze his cattle. And it probably is a he, although it may be a she. Um, and, uh, and basically the, the poor then that are probably helping to manage this land as employees are planting their crops up on these stiff hillsides. And we can imagine that, you know, logically from a science perspective, it would make sense to just reverse that, take this rangeland, put it up here and, uh, and then grow our crops down here. Um, but, but again, it's, it's not just science, it's, it's economics, it's policy, it's a lot of different factors. Um, and even in this area, though, science can help because um, there are, there's a small area here where a lot of the soil that eroded here has deposited down here, um, just uphill of this gully. And you can see that the corn is a little bit more productive in there. And maybe if we just focused on focusing all of our fertilizer resources and our management and weeding and everything in that small area, we might actually grow as much corn as we're currently growing on this entire hillside, which is continuing to erode. So again, thinking about rangeland, you know, in, in Las Cruces, we tend to think about, okay, we've got the valley, and that's not rangeland. That's houses and pecans and cotton and, and everything that we can irrigate. And then we got outside of the valley, which is rangeland. And sometimes the, 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 the distinctions aren't quite as clear. Um, so how do we figure out what the potential of our land is? What is the sustainable potential of our land? And uh, this is a, a, an image I use because it's kind of a joke. I say, get off your stupid phone and dig a hole to find out what kind of soil you've got. It turns out the app that I'm going to show you later um, actually helps you dig that hole and interpret what you're finding in that hole. Um, and so that's really what I've been focusing on for um, really for the last uh, five, seven years is trying to figure out, okay, it's, it's nice that we have all this soil science information but how can we get it into the hands of anybody anywhere in the world so that they can make their own interpretations about their land? So this, um, this photo here is uh, in Kenya. Um, this is actually a photo from Iceland. I, was, I taught a course in Iceland, um, actually it was kind of a train the trainer. I taught the professors there and they're now teaching the course. And um, these are hands from literally around the world. Um, I think that one's from um, Kyrgyzstan, um, several from various countries in Africa, 
I think she was from, um, I believe from Uganda. Um, and, uh, and then of course, a, a couple of, um, of, of Icelanders hands who, who never get tan. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any pigmentation to begin with. And, and they're all learning in Iceland how to texture their soil, figure out what kind of soil they have, how much sand, silt, and clay it is, so they can go back to the countries. And, uh, and we use exactly the same technique for, for training folks. And the, the, the app actually leads people through the process. Of, and so you can go back out in your backyard later today, if you'd like, unless you're going to be jumping on the Super Bowl here in a few minutes. Um, and, uh, and, and take a look and, and uh, learn a little bit about your soil, just as they were doing in Iceland and, and back. And, and the reason we need to do that, like in Bolivia, the example I showed there, and, and, and as in, in South Dakota, is we need to see beyond what we see. So what we see when we walk out in rangelands is land with productive grasses. And, uh, and, and just, you know, it's like, well, of course, it's, it's, it's um, as, as, um, as people observed when they moved west through the United States, I mean, there's all this land and what could we be doing with it? And, and the answer is we could probably be doing a lot with it to sustain both nature and humans. Um, but we really need to see beyond what we see um, because it may be that some things won't work out quite so well. So we define land potential as uh, really the sustainable potential of the land. And, and again, at that same workshop that I led in Namibia, the, the very insightful um, participants there, I've learned a huge amount in my international work that I've brought back to the United States. But it, it, rangeland condition has to do with the potential of the place. You're gonna manage something, but you don't know where you are. So you really, we need to understand where we are and, and, and what the condition is, what the potential is. This piece of land here is, is currently we got a few uh, perennial grasses, um, some annual, some of you may have known Chris Havstad, he's still in the community, he's retired now. Um, and uh, Paul Drew, a former postdoc here. And we were out and we were trying to figure out uh, what that sustainable potential is. What's the rainfall so, there, do you know? Uh, this area here was not too far from Las Cruces, so, so not too much more than 10 inches. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but actually, as it turns out, this was an annuals. It had been overgrazed. There was a well just to our um, behind us here, um, and um, and it, it did have the potential to support perennial grasses, but not a huge amount of production. You know, you'd be you'd, you'd have you'd have one animal per you know a minimum of forty acres. It's holding one up. Yeah. What's that? Oh, Roy, Carol, were you asking? No, it was not I. Oh, okay. Anyway, I just Sarah? wanted to uh, ask you, Jeff. I, I understand before Europeans came to New Mexico and different places, and I've looked, I've talked to people. It's not my specialty, but uh, uh, we used to have a pretty high plains grassland around here, and of course now we've got all desert shrub. Is that true? Well, you know, that's, um, that's, you know, I, I was going to switch to a Google Earth um, thing and we could, we could do that now, actually. Um, and, and, and we could take a little tour and I can show you where they were talking about. Um, okay. In fact, why don't we just, let's, let's do that. Let's, uh, All right. let's switch over to uh, Google Earth. And, um, oh, that could and be the so one. here we go. Unless it actually sticks to the flat. What? What's that? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, so um, just to kind of orient everybody here, um, here's El Paso. Okay, and uh, and and moving up the the, the valley here into uh, into Las Cruces. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and the Mesilla Valley and uh, White Sands National Monument here, of course, and the, the Missile Range, the Sacramento Mountains. So Cloudcroft is up, up in here someplace. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is just kind of take us in here and uh, we'll just start, start in Las Cruces. And uh, let's see, maybe we can even go 
And I guess you guys haven't been to the, the church in a while, but we could just kind of start start here. Uh, well, down, um, yeah, there's the university golf course, and there's the church down there. And uh, let's just make our way up up 25, and um, we'll take a right, and we'll head out, head out 70. And, um, oops, sorry, I'm a little bit of extra zoom in there. Um, and uh, and now we're gonna we're gonna go off, and we're gonna head up to the Hornada. And um, I know, whoops. No, I, I'm my apologies. I you'd think I'd be able to drive better. I've been driving for a few <laughs> decades now, but don't take take away my license. <clears throat> it's uh, <laughs> not safe. Okay, I just uh, and not only that, but I, I thought I was lost, and I sure was. I wasn't on seventy at all, was I? Here we go. Now we're on. Now we're on seventy, and um, and we're heading out. And you can see what we're seeing here. You see the differences in color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any, any idea what's causing that big difference in color? Well, it has to be uh, dirt or range. Yeah. So you're actually seeing the color of the soil. This is probably an right. image from right. the from the winter time. Right. And um, and the red soils are typically sands that have been transported down the Rio Grande. So they came down the Rio Grande here and blown up out of the Rio Grande. So our winds are from west to east, okay? And they blow up and they literally, when the, the Rio Grande would, would just sort of wind its way back and forth across the valley. In fact, at one point, it actually made its way straight down through here, uh, through the Hornada Basin. But you can see actually, if we go up here now, so the Chihuahua Desert Nature Park is, is right down in here, okay? Um, there's that new golf course down there, um, and Toronto Desert Nature Park, the Doniana Mountains, Southern Doniana is here where all the new bike trails have been put in, Northern Doniana is here, uh, and uh, Mount Summerford, and, um, and you can actually see the streaking and the patterns of the sand that was blown up out of the Rio Grande yeah. and uh, up over the escarpment, okay, and this white stuff here. That's actually, people familiar with caliche, that, that, that white limestone-like stuff that we uh -huh. see? Uh -huh. Yeah, so caliche is just calcium carbonate. It's the same as Tums, the same as the antacid that we take uh, chemically, um, but it's actually formed in soil. And what happens is the calcium is deposited in the rain. It leaches down through the soil. Carbon dioxide from roots uh, respiring, so carbon uh, roots and plants just like plants fix carbon, but they also emit carbon when their their roots are are, are, are respiring in the plant itself. And um, and so the carbon dioxide gets together with the calcium and it forms this rock, um, almost like a rock. And and it gets exposed when you get some erosion. So what's happening here is that this sort of flat area uh, up in here, the plains, is getting cut back. And you're starting to see just the edge of that calcium carbonate there. And if you dig down into it, you can actually see it here too. So I am getting to your, your question about the tall grass, but I wanted to lay a context, set okay. of context first. So I haven't, I haven't forgotten. I don't drive very well, but I can, I can still talk. So, um, so here we are. Um, we're moving up into the Hornada. Again, here's the, here's the, um, the, uh, the Chihuahua Desert Nature Park. And as we come up, Look what we got here. Yeah. What do you think that pattern is? Is that natural? It doesn't look like it. it. Doesn't look like it. No. Somebody actually tried to grow something there. Yeah. <laughs> and we're still seeing that. Okay. Those are. Yeah. Let's zoom in a little bit further. Look at that. Yeah. That looked like somebody actually tried to to plant something. Yep. Yeah. So people that uh that that first came here, you know, when, when, when we go when you go to the redwoods and uh people that have gone and visited the redwood forest, are all the trees ten, twelve feet across? No. Well no. 
No, of course not. But some of them are. When you come back and you tell everybody about the trees that you saw, do you tell them about the little ones? <laughs> no. <laughs> of course not. We tell them about the big ones. And not only that, but if it's grass, you want to make sure, you know, grass grows really tall when we have really wet years and not so tall when we have dry years. So you want to tell them about the tallest grass you saw and the wettest year. And the tall grass was right here. Oh. These soils are loamy soils. They hold a lot of water. And not only that, but look where they are. Here's the San Andres Mountains. You can see the, where the water runs off the San Andres Mountains. And you can see the paths. And of course, the Hornada is a closed basin. Uh, the water that enters the Hornada Basin does not go into the Rio Grande. It stays there. And so um, there's something called Isaac's Lake. You might have heard of Isaac's Lake. Here's Isaac's Lake right here. As you're coming up the Hornada Road towards the... Uh, Here's the entrance to the, 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 the nature park. Isaac's Lake, and for a while, I actually saw a sign. I don't know if they were serious or not, but it said lakefront property. And of course, <laughs> Isaac's Lake is a playa. Isaac's Lake is a playa, and, and the reason that it's there, and it's only there for you know a few days to a couple of months, depending on the summer, the reason it's there is because of all this water that's run down. So even though Las Cruces gets what 10 inches of rain a year right. which is nothing right nothing yeah. i mean you how many people are growing gardens in their backyards without any without any irrigation not many yeah let, let, let me know and i want to know what crop you're growing because <laughs> i want some of that um so so basically what you got here is some land that had grass growing on it that wasn't getting 10 inches a year, it was probably getting 20 inches a year. And then they go out and they ride their horses through that land during a wet year, an unusually wet year. And back in the 1880s, there were a few years that were, were, were quite wet. So it might've been maybe 15 inches they got during that summer. <coughs> and then um, they got the extra moisture, so 30 inches. So now where are we? 30 inches of rain, we're in Missouri. How tall does the grass grow in, what's that, Minnesota? Yeah. How tall, Minnesota, where I grew up. <laughs> yeah, Minnesota. So how tall does, does the grass grow there? Oh, well, it, it's pretty darn really tall. Well. You can grow corn and soybeans there without any irrigation. And, and we generally have exactly. uh, about a low uh, average around 40, uh, low 40s. Inches. Okay. Average. So, yeah, so there you go. So, so yes, the grass was growing tall there. Yes, if you were lucky, you could probably grow some crops. And it's a combination of where you are in the landscape, but also what kind of soil you got. In this lighter colored soil, that's a nice, rich, loamy garden soil. You add some organic matter to that, and that's just going to be as good a soil as you'll find in the Midwest. Whereas... Most of this, I'm going to zoom out now because I want you to see the red stuff is almost pure sand. It's 80 to 90 percent sand, doesn't hold any water. The gray stuff is mostly gravelly and a lot of it's shallow. So it's, it's shallow to bedrock or in many cases, it's shallow to that really hard layer of caliche that you're seeing here, this calcium carbonate. So this, this white over here is that nice loam that also has a fair bit of calcium in it because there's limestone up in the San Andres. And this is an outcrop of that, of that hard caliche layer. Um, and so again, you know, understanding the variability in the landscape is just incredibly valuable. And fortunately, in the United States, we have access to really good soil maps. Now they won't tell you exactly what the soil is at a specific location. But they will tell you what the soils you would expect to find in that area, okay? And then you can go out and dig a hole and find out which one you got. So another story, and this is at least third hand. So if you quote it, don't attribute it to me. Um, but um, but uh, 
but I, I, I heard that when the, um, the developers of this golf course here bought this, they went out there and they looked at it and they said, oh, sand, golf course, we love sand. We just irrigate it. We can push it up into whatever shape we want. We can have nice little hills and valleys and we can line the little ponds with some plastic and it'll be great. Well, what they didn't realize is that under this sand on the surface is that caliche layer, that really hard layer. And my understanding is it, it cost them a little bit more, um, maybe a lot more, because they had to break up that, that soil layer that's that hard calcium carbonate, that, that caliche layer. So had they consulted a soil map, it probably would have said there was a mix of soils in this area. In fact, there, there is a mix of soils in this area. But all of them have some level of that calcium carbonate or, or caliche development. And it looks to me like, I haven't actually driven out there, but um, it yeah, looks I've, to me. Yeah, I've played there a few times. Yeah. Have you? Okay. Nice course? Oh, yeah. It's a nice course. It's a little bit uh, wide open, and you get the wind, yeah. you know. Yep, I can imagine. Well, apparently they figured out then how do they broke out that stuff up and and got it shaped how they wanted it. But um, but yeah, just whether you're building a golf course or growing quinoa or trying to convince your relatives from from Minnesota to come out and plant some corn with you, um, <laughs> it's 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 good to know what you're what you're looking at. I agree. Uh, Jeff, so speaking, <clears throat> Jeff, yeah. I saw a video recently. A man down in Mexico. He's um, he's planting and cultivating agave, and he he uh -huh. uh, chews it up to make uh, plant food, very very nutritious plant food, um, and of course it uses practically no water at all. Mm -hmm. it, it's our century plants here, and they you yep. know it's a, and um, he's making a good living doing that. And so I'm thinking that, uh, you know, our pecan farmers need to cut their trees down and, and get them out of the soil and put agave in there. What do you think? Well, we could, I think we could do that. I think our pecan farmers would, um, would have a hard time making a living. I um, think so too. <laughs> but but they, they would make, you know, you certainly could do that. And you certainly would um, be able to, uh, you would generate some income in the United States, whether that would be a positive net income or just gross income, <laughs> meaning uh, you, you could end up with generating an income but have a negative cash flow in that case, um, just because of the different economics between here and Mexico. Um, but but yes, that's it, that may be something that that we may be looking at in the in in, in the future. And in fact, um, your your introduction is perfect because I was actually going to transition back to pecans, in fact. So I'm going to switch back over to this slide and let's go to the next slide. So I, that, I did not pay you to, to make that segue, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, well, that was, that was perfect. That was impressive. Um, so here's an example. This is actually our place um, uh, where we do have uh, about an acre of pecans um, down in the South Valley. We're just off Carver Road. And, um, uh, and, and, and we actually, it's a sort of interesting context, is we bought it for sustainability reasons because this is a passive solar adobe house. And right over here, we've got a 10 kilowatt solar array. And, and so it was kind of a sustainability thing. I didn't know anything about the cons at the time. I was a rangeland scientist. Um, I knew they took a lot of water and I knew that, that we had a well and, and <clears throat> some, some, uh, some water rights from the, from the ditch. Um, but I've learned a lot. And, and actually, we're, we're currently renting to a, a pecan farmer um, most of the house. I just um, keep a, a couple of rooms back here in the back when I'm in, in town. And um, meanwhile, we got a couple of neighbors uh, here, and um, they had a couple of pecan trees, actually just several kind of scattered around the house, and two in particular. One was yielding really well, and one really wasn't yielding at all. And, um, and so it, a neighbor asked me to come over and, and uh, I've got a chainsaw and said, you know, we just got to cut these trees down. I'm going to cut both of them down because, because actually they're, they're, they're kind of watering together and they're just, <clears throat> you know, I just I need to get rid of this one because just watering is not producing pecans. And I said, well, that's 
it's really interesting. And I, you know, went ahead and cut it down. And then of course we're sitting there chatting after I've cut it down. And I said, what was different about these trees? And he said, well, nothing, you know, they're planted at the same time. They, they got some, and, and they were big trees when they, they, they got them, you know, how they'll, they'll take these trees and transplant them. And, um, and I said, well, the fertilizer? No, 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 we didn't use any fertilizer on either one of them. We just, you know, it was lawn and so forth. And so it probably got some extra from that. I said, watering? No, 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 they watered the same. And um, so everything was the same. And um, then I said, what about the soil? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. And this one, when we were digging the hole, it kept caving back in again. I said, oh, <clears throat> caving back in again. You don't need to be a soil scientist to figure that one out. That's sand. He said, yep, that was sand. He said, yeah, okay. So we got that one. How about this one? Oh, yeah, that was, that was harder to dig through, but, but at least it wasn't came back in. It was loam. So we looked at it. Yep, sure enough, it was loam. Well, it turns out that a loam holds over twice as much water as a sand. And why is that important? Well, it's important because you need to irrigate a lot more often if your soil doesn't hold as much water. And this applies to your backyard garden as well. And a lot of people add compost or organic matter to help, you know, if you've got a sandy soil, it's going to help you hold more water. Um, but, uh, but in general, you know, your, your, your loam that has more clay in it, mix of sand, salt, and clay is going to hold a lot more water. So what's going on there is he needed to increase the irrigation frequency and reduce the amount because he was adding water. It was probably just going right through past the roots. Okay, which is, you know, fine. It goes back down into the groundwater. So that's good for the groundwater. Not really wasting it in that sense. But, um, uh, but, but, he's, but in the case of the loam, he'd irrigate and it would hold plenty of water. Um, and uh, and so, so just, you know, simple little things like this, sort of not only matching land use with sustainable potential. And so, you know, from a, a sustainability perspective, this is um, the, the Mesilla Valley is actually a really good place to, grow pecans. We don't hardly need any pesticides. In fact, we don't use any pesticides at all on our pecans um, because the, the pest pressure is much less than it is there in, in Georgia. And it's flat. You're not going to get um, uh, issues there. Um, but they use, do use a lot of water and we don't have a lot of water in the desert. So we're going to have to make some decisions uh, coming down the, the, the pike here. Another good thing about the Mesilla Valley, of course, is the water that we're using is regenerated water. We're not using fossil, even when we use groundwater. That groundwater is coming from water that's basically replenished. The Rio Grande is sitting over here west of us, and um, when water runs down the Rio Grande, it actually um, refills the aquifer. Now, for those of you that have been following the news, that could end up being a problem for us because Texas is going to try to convince us that, that our, our groundwater is surface water, and that could affect all of us in Las Cruces because we use that as well. Um, because it's, we're effectively getting it from surface water. From a sustainability perspective, it's a better thing. From a legal perspective, maybe not so much. And uh, happy to talk about water politics and economics and, and so forth. But, um, but sustainability is always a, a, it's a, it's what I've spent my career on and, um, and, and the trade-offs involved. And, you know, where should we be growing pecans? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's reasons to, to grow them and, in um, in almost every place they're grown, and, and sustainability reasons not to grow them every place they're grown. They they, they use a lot of pesticides in Georgia uh, on, on on their pecans, um, and if they're not, then they're they're uh, having to deal with with um, you know fairly complicated integrated pest management approaches and or um, yield reductions. So um, so again, we start by matching land with the sustainable potential. And I think of that from a biophysical perspective, but then you got to think of it in this global perspective. And, and then you got to think about people's rights to their own livelihoods. So, you know, um, you know, who, who's, who's to, you know, do we, do we, uh, do we want the United Nations telling um, the uh, pecan farmers in Southern New Mexico that, um, that you can't grow pecans. And, you know, most people in the United States would say, well, that's, that's not the role of the United Nations. And yet, um, uh, and, and I would agree, um, absolutely. I, I think those are decisions that need to be made at the, at the, at the national and subnational level, um, and, uh, and so forth. But at the same time, if we've got, if we're going to keep reproducing and we're going to have 9 billion people and then 10 billion people and who knows how many people, um, 
at some point we're going to have to make some pretty hard decisions about what gets grown where and you know whether or not we get to eat the con um to bring it right home so so to that end um we uh we developed a uh, uh, something called the Land Potential Knowledge System. And this is a mobile app um, and um, uh, that uh, for, uh, it essentially gives people access to that knowledge information. It's being used all over the world. These are different locations people have uploaded. Hey, Jim, and is um, that background noise, is that, you know where that's coming from? I don't, and I'm actually not hearing background noise, so maybe I'm creating it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really annoying. It's a, a clicking sound. Yeah, it's uh, it's rhythmic. It's yeah, rhythmic. I'll be darn. Let well, me uh, let me just pounding noise. Yeah, it sounds like a, a pounding. Watch right next to the microphone. I'll be darn. Okay, I've certainly had audio problems this week um, due to the computer, <laughs> but nothing like that. But since you guys hear it and I don't, that means I'm the problem. So um, let me, my audio is going through my phone. I'm gonna hang up and dial in again. You'll still see my face, um, but uh, let me just dial in again. I'll be right back. Yeah, it disappeared. <laughs> yeah, it but it wasn't there when we, you first started. So it's, it, it, you know, when you first started talking, it wasn't oh, no, there. It was, it was fine, just recently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the uh, modern the modern day of Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Well, while he's waiting, Paul, do you know if um, his Google Maps is that anything special, or could we all get that kind of detail? Oh, I think we could with today's technology. Oh, I, I, I think we could. Yeah. Because uh, he was coming right out to my home on the Mesa there, and I, it was pretty amusing. <laughs> <laughs> How bad it was. <laughs> All right. Is the pounding gone? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh? All right. This is, you know, given the fact that I'm on Zoom calls about uh, two to 10 hours a day, um, yeah. This is I clearly got some things yeah, to figure I, out here. Um, sense, and Monday, uh, Mon uh, they also work. Uh, uh, they have to work for a living, unlike me. And uh, anyway, the same thing. They're on the Zoom all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I guess this is what I'll be doing Monday morning, maybe even this afternoon, if I don't get out for a bike ride here. All right. So. Um, Go ahead and share my screen. And like I said, I'm just assuming you guys are going to jump in with questions and so forth, because I've got, like I said, I've got way more yeah, material and, than we're going to get through. And please do. So, anyway, we got a small group, so we can do that. Um, so we jumped ahead to Google Earth, and that was that was good. Now we're going to, um, now I'm going to skip that one. Let's, uh, let's see. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to uh the oops I am potential knowledge system and um just run a quick video and actually um I just realized because of the way that I'm running my um the way I'm running this you guys aren't gonna be able to hear the video I'll bet you because I'm running my audio through this. Let's go ahead and try it. And, but I'm pretty sure there's, yeah, there's no way you're not going to hear the, um, yeah, you're not, you're not hearing any audio, are you? No. I know. The world of global oh, wait, here we go. Oh, there it is. We support farmers, ranchers, gardeners, land use planners, and other natural resource managers with open source tools that allow them to easily access knowledge. You guys are hearing that now? Yeah, yeah. PKS, anyone, anywhere in the world can collect, store, interpret, and, if they wish, share their own soil, vegetation cover, and management data. The Land PKS platform is designed to be used for a wide variety of management systems and objectives. 
Our free iPhone and Android mobile apps and online data portal include four modules that can be used individually or together to meet your specific needs. You can discover the value and potential of your land with the Land Info module, powered by the Land PKS Soil Identification Algorithm and U.S. and International Soil Maps. You can access soil information anywhere in the world. Land PKS provides even more accurate soil identification with the user's own site observations, including slope and soil texture. The Land Management module is a quick and easy tool for planning and keeping track of management. You can use it to track planting and harvest dates, weed and pest management, precipitation, and more, all in a simple calendar-based interface. Finally, you can monitor change in your land with our soil health and land cover modules. In soil health, you can record both visual and lab indicators, including soil smell, erosion, and organic matter. Land cover is a rapid 20-minute or less vegetation monitoring method for rangelands, pastures, and cropland. Access your data anytime from your mobile phone or our online data portal. With these tools in hand, Land PKS can help you make better informed management decisions for healthier and more productive land today and in the future. Now, uh, Jeff, can you can this kind of information be available across the country for farmers or? Oh know? yeah, yeah. That's that's actually available globally. Um, so this is this app can be used that that this map here. Yeah. Uh, you see on the screen. That's that's every place that the app has been used. Okay. And and it also um, something I didn't show there, but it actually. Um, if you go there, you download the app and then log in, you'll need a Gmail login because we don't manage the logins. Um, and uh, when you get to the first screen, after you swipe through the intro screens, you'll see a little button called Habitat. Uh -huh. And it also, what's not in that video, because we didn't have it at that time, it actually provides some information about wildlife habitat, some of the species that can occur in, in you know, at your location what their habitat requirements are. And we developed that in cooperation with the Nature Conservancy. So they actually, them and the Bird Conservancy, the Rockies. Yeah. So all sorts of different information. Yeah, we, I was with the World Bank, we had a project down in Malawi. And of course, uh, I don't have, a soil identification is an issue, but they just poor farm management, quite frankly, and their, their yield was just terrible. And so it's just, practical farm management, rotation, and those kind of things. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and and they, their yields are practically nothing, but it's just a matter of doing the right kind of management. Yeah, yeah they are actually using this um, land PKS in Malawi now. Um, there's a, a group out of Michigan State University that's using it and, and basically helping them while they're, they're working on improving management, they're also trying to match management to the different types of soils. Yeah, not using I'm the not app. sure, because so. they need it badly. I'm just using that as one example. Yep, yeah. Um, great, well, just a, a few minutes left here. Um, any other questions? Yes, anyone, please. Comments? Uh, Jeff, I'm curious. I There is a channel on Sirius XM radio that has 24-hour uh, farm information. They talk about prices and how to uh, treat land in order to make it productive. And they have a program called uh, P, uh, Farm PhD. Uh, call uh -huh. it. <laughs> how much uh, cooperation is there between the range people and the farm people? Um. So I, there's, it, it kind of depends on where you are in the country, um, where you've got farmers that are managing livestock because they have a diverse types of land. There's, there's actually quite a bit of, of, of interaction there. Um, obviously with the Hornada and, and, um, and, and this program with land PKS, you know, I, I work across all sectors, um, the farming, ranching, um, even to some extent forestry, there are, the app is being used by um, uh, actually by a, 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 an urban carbon sequestration program in Boulder, um, citizen science essentially. And uh, I just had a call with a, a group out of um, just up the Hudson from New York on, on the east side of the, the river there. 
um, that is uh, looking at doing the same thing, doing kind of a citizen science program with it. So, so you know, the, the, the tools like we're, we're developing are, are really designed to be used, you know, globally. Um, but, uh, but it sounds like, you know, if that one's talking about crop prices and so forth, they're really focusing on the Midwest farmers um, as opposed to, you know, the, the, the ranching. There are other um, programs and so forth. There's a really good podcast uh, if anybody is do podcast called the art of range, the ART of range podcast. And it's out of Washington state university and that very much very similar to what you're talking about, but of course it's just a podcast. I think he's a, he's an extension agent and uh, he actually interviewed me for one of those about a year ago, I guess. Um, and just, you know, talking about not just land BKS, but more generally about rangeland monitoring and, and so forth. Um, Anyone else? Yeah, we had in our even our farm that I grew up on in southern Minnesota, we had uh, a, a, a range areas for our dairy cattle, uh, which was kind of obvious right next to the uh, river, that sort of thing, and and it was just too damp for uh, for you know uh, uh, farming, and so that's kind of true on a lot of lands across the country, a mixture of range and cropland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that greater, you know, that's one of the things they're really starting to promote now is going back to integrating livestock production and crop production and sort of to make better use of the land, but also it keeps the manure cycle um, a little bit tighter. So, you, you know, Early on, we didn't, have, we didn't use fertilizer. It wasn't until the fifties that we started in, and what we did was we had enough livestock that we kept it pretty well, you know, fertilized with uh, manure. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that works up to a point. At yeah, some point, you're going to start to run out of some things yeah. like phosphorus. Exactly. I mean, up to a point. Yeah, but for organic matter and nitrogen, it worked fine. Absolutely. And yeah, nitrogen and nitrogen and your organic matter, you can totally keep up with it. And it's just once you've you've gotten to the point where you've exported so much of the, the, the nutrients that, that, that aren't fixed from the atmosphere. So nitrogen is the only one that's fixed, of course. Um, and you've exported them in the grain, exactly. unless you start bringing human manure back, you know, then, then, you know, it, it, we're, uh, the, yeah. the, if, we, if we start recycling the biosolid waste, then yeah, we can, we can yeah. make that cycle a lot less leaky. Right. Any other questions? Well, Come could, could you rotate other animals through it? You know, like instead of running cows, run sheep or goats or pigs on the, outside sure yeah it really depends on the soil it depends on the crop depends on the climate and most of all it depends on the markets yeah. and so one of the problems that we have is is you know there there and and i think with covid now a lot of states are actually looking at making it easier to locally process livestock so if i raise a pig and I don't want to process it myself, butcher it myself, I'm going to have a hard time in Las Cruces finding somebody to do that for me. The best person is probably going to be somebody that goes and, and, and a hunter, you know, that, that's, that, that, that hunts oryx or, or deer or elk or whatever, and have them, you know, help me process it. Um, because they're just, you know, we just don't have, there's a place in Silver City, I don't know if anybody of you have gotten, um, you know, bought a, a side of beef. Um, but But the the way the regulations regulation um and sometimes health regulations now you know ironically the same set of regulations are are, are resulting in these crazy meat packing plants that have all sorts of health issues but to some extent good intent maybe some cases a case of monopoly sort of control paul can probably talk more more uh knowledgeably about this than i can but the result is we just don't have you know, we may have a butcher, but we don't necessarily have someone that can take a live animal and, yeah, and get it to the point article, where we can consume it. Just a major article in the New York Times about this is that uh, they're locally uh, kind of getting, especially with COVID and so forth, uh, uh, processing kind of develop that aspect of uh, mixed farming, which we used to have. But we have monopolized yeah. uh, uh, the operations so much, especially the processing that uh, we've kind of gotten away from that. But uh, for all kinds of reasons, there are developing reasons for us to go back to it because it has 
for you. First of all, you have locally produced food. People know where it comes from, and people are really, really feel strong about that. So anyway, I see Sarah's coming oh, back. So, so somebody that uh, kind of slaughters cows could not slaughter pigs, for example, then. That's what you're saying. Well, they might be able to, but the, the, the issue is there isn't even anybody to slaughter the cow. Oh, okay. Any of that. There's no, there's there's nobody as far as I know, there is nobody in in um in Las Cruces um that's that's licensed to do that. And even in in uh the, the guy in Silver City was basically a game processor. He was processing people's, you know, deer and elk and and so forth that, that were harvested um locally. And um and so the deal was you had to buy the animal and take the animal to him, but you'd get it delivered by the, by the rancher. And then you, we would pay him to then process it right for us. So and the rancher couldn't, we still have those small operations. Okay. We still do small, uh, uh, you know, we have big ones too, but uh, they're still small ones, but that's not the nature out here. I don't think it's not, not enough hmm. lifestyle. Okay. Yeah, well, in less than livestock, but also just, again, you, you really need to look at, at regulation and how regulation is being implemented. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing with, you know, we, 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 we had some contamination of, of, of spinach, um, uh, you know, right? And, and suddenly the amount of plastic um, and, and artificial fertilizers and everything else skyrocketed because, you know, we, we don't, the United States does not do a good job of, of risk analysis and, and really none of the countries, the EU is just as bad. We basically look at one thing and we say, we wanna minimize the risk for this thing. And we don't look at what the environmental or health impacts are of those decisions. Yeah, it's yeah absolutely. Holistic perspective, so. Well, okay, it's uh, past our time and I'm ready to uh, give uh, Jeffrey a big hand. Yay. Uh, well, thanks. It's, it's good to be in Las Cruces for a few for for an hour this afternoon. <laughs> it's seventy degrees down here, fella. I bet that isn't the true in Boulder. Uh, no, no, it's about forty, I think. So yeah, <laughs> thirty-five. Next, next week we're going to have uh, well, this should be really interesting. Our church member Don Nettig is going to be talking about uh, the uh, economic growth and in inequality. And I'm glad to have him talking about it rather than me because uh, from a different perspective. So it should be very interesting. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great afternoon. Um, and especially with it being the Super Bowl, I think. Right. Yeah. Everybody go off and watch the football game. I, I got to go buy a TV so I can watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Bye. Yeah. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Take Have care. a good afternoon. Bye -bye.